So far in our discussion on glycogen metabolism, we only discussed how the liver cells and skeletal muscle cells actually take the glycogen and break it down into the glucose monomer. So in the case of liver cells, they release the glucose into the blood plasma to help control the blood glucose levels, while in the case of skeletal muscle cells, once they break down the glycogen into glucose, they take that glucose and build ATP molecules to carry out voluntary motion. Now, the question is, how do we go in reverse? How do we take the glucose monomers, glucose precursors, and build glycogen? And why would our body, would, uh, why would our body actually want to carry out that process in the first place? Well, let's suppose we... Um, Let's suppose we ingest a meal that is rich in carbohydrates. And so what that means is, inside our blood plasma, we're going to have a rise in blood glucose levels. And once the blood glucose levels actually rise, the liver cells we want, will want to maintain the proper blood glucose levels. And so they will uptake some of that glucose into the liver cells. And these liver cells will take the glucose precursor molecules and begin building the glycogen. And they will store the glycogen in tiny granules found in the cytoplasm of liver cells. Now, what exactly is the process by which we synthesize glycogen in liver cells and skeletal muscle cells? Well, that's what we're going to focus briefly in this lecture and the next lecture. Now, in the same analogous way that gluconeogenesis, the building of glucose molecules, and glycolysis, the breaking down of glucose molecules, in the same analogous way that these two processes are not simply the reverse of one another, we see that glycogen synthesis is not simply the reverse of the breakdown of glycogen. In fact, as we'll see in this lecture, glycogen synthesis actually follows a completely different reaction pathway when it uses the glucose precursors to actually build the glycogen polysaccharide. Now, there are two important processes that we have to consider when actually building the glycogen. Before we can actually take the glucose and attach the glucose onto that growing glycogen polymer, we have to make that glucose a reactive molecule. Because glucose by itself, and more specifically, glucose 1-phosphate, is not reactive enough, it's not high in energy, to basically attach itself onto that glycogen chain. What we have to do before anything is actually activate that glucose molecule. And by activating, I mean we have to make it more reactive. We have to increase its energy. So glucose by itself is not active enough to attach onto that growing glycogen chain. Therefore, the first step in this process is to actually transform glucose into a more reactive and high energy form. And that's exactly what happens in this step and this step here. So let's begin with this step here. So we begin with the glucose 1-phosphate. So this is the glucose molecule shown here that we ultimately want to attach onto that growing glycogen chain. But the problem is this bond here isn't very reactive and we want to make it more reactive. We want to make it higher in energy. And so what happens in that inside our cells is we, re, uh, we react the glucose 1-phosphate with uridine triphosphate. So we have the uridine and 3-phosphate groups, UTP. And the enzyme that catalyzes this step is UDP glucose pyrophos uh, uh, pyrophosphorylase. And so what UDP, uh, UDP glucose pyrophosphorylase does is it takes this red structure here and attaches it onto this region here. And we form a uridine diphosphate glucose molecule and we also form a pyrophosphate. So this pyrophosphate is basically this section here. Now, the thing about the UDP glucose is it's a much more reactive molecule. Why? Well, because we have this additional group that contains a high negative charge. And so that makes this entire molecule, and more specifically, this ester bond here, becomes much more reactive. And so as we'll see in the next step shown here, we're able to actually cleave that bond and attach this glucose molecule onto that growing glycogen chain. 
Now, this reaction is actually reversible, and notice the equilibrium doesn't lie on this side, it's actually somewhere in between. And so what that means is, we, our body has to couple this reaction with a reaction that is product favored. And that's exactly where the second reaction uh, comes into play. The pyrophosphate here in the presence of water will actually be hydrolyzed into two orthophosphate molecules. And this reaction is very much product favored. And so because this reaction takes place, in the uh, uh, towards the product side we continually use up the pyrophosphate and that drives this entire reaction towards this side and that's exactly what allows this reaction to actually take place in the first place and if we sum up these two reactions this will be the net reaction for activating the glucose so on the reactant side we have glucose one phosphate this molecule here we have the uridine triphosphate this molecule here we have the water and on the product side we have the UDP glucose that is formed here and we also have the two uh, orthophosphates that are formed here notice the pyrophosphates disappear because they're actually intermediates in these two reactions so they cross out from both sides and this is what our net reaction actually is now, once we form that activated glucose molecule, uh, we're now ready to actually attach that activated glucose molecule onto that growing glycogen chain. And this is what takes place in this step here. So we take that UDP glucose shown here, and this is our growing glycogen chain. Now, in the presence of an enzyme known as glycogen synthase, what happens is we essentially take the glucose molecule, this structure here, and we attach it onto this region here. More specifically, if we examine the terminal glucose residue that contains a free hydroxyl group on the fourth carbon, this essentially acts as a nucleophile. It attacks this carbon here of the glucose and it establishes it creates an alpha 1,4 glycosidic bond and it displaces it kicks off this entire molecule here so this is what we form after this step so the hydroxyl group on the fourth carbon so if we actually label our carbons so let's say this is carbon 1 carbon 2 carbon 3 carbon 3 4, carbon 5, and carbon 6. So this hydroxyl group on the fourth carbon of this terminal glucose residue of the growing poly of the growing polysaccharide chain basically attacks this carbon here, carbon 1, displacing this entire group, and that creates that alpha 1,4 glycosidic bond. Now, notice that glycogen synthase only creates alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds, but we know glycogen also contains alpha-1,6 glycosidic bonds about every 10 glucose residues. So, how exactly do we create alpha-1,6 glycosidic bonds? Well, this is what we're going to focus on in the next lecture. And the final thing that I'd like to mention about glycogen synthase is glycogen synthase can only attach glucose molecules onto a polymer, a growing polysaccharide chain that consists of more than four glucose molecules. And so what that basically means is before this reaction can actually take place, we have to begin with a primer molecule. So how do we actually establish the primer molecule? Well, once again, we'll talk about that in the next lecture. So in this lecture, we have to understand two important things. Number one is glycogen synthesis is simply not the reverse process of glycogen breakdown. They follow completely different pathways in the same way that gluconeogenesis is not simply the reverse of glycolysis. And the second thing we have to understand is glucose 1-phosphate, so the glucose molecule that we ultimately want to actually add onto that growing glycogen chain, is not reactive enough to actually attach onto it. What we have to do is we have to first activate it. And the way that we activate that glucose 1-phosphate is by reacting it with the uridine triphosphate, UTP molecule. What that does is it adds an additional charge onto it and it makes this 
this ester bond much more reactive. And so when this process takes place, this can act as a strong nucleophile to this good electrophile this bond is created and that breaks the bond and kicks off this entire departing group.